Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Friday. It is the sixth day of October, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. A uh, drastic change in temperature over what we've had the last several days, several weeks. Uh, high today, just around 50 degrees. Low tonight is upper 30s, lower 40s. There is no for, uh, frost forecast for the foreseeable future, but don't worry, it will come and just keep an eye on it because it's that time of year we get a, a clear night. The wind's blowing and there's a significant cloud cover out there, at least I haven't been out there in the last 20 minutes or so, but that helps keep the warm air in, the air movement, and of course the cloud cover is kind of like a lid, a blanket, if you will, but boy, if the air it's still and the clouds move away we could we have a we could uh, be in for some frost and it is that time of year i like this time of year once you get a frost i mean yeah it kills all the flowers off there's some that survive that of course there's the decorative cabbages and the mums can usually make it through uh, a light frost but the bugs go away now the bugs haven't been bad in this area this year because it's been so dry but it's just nice to have them go away a lot of the other varmints go away since the last winter was so mild they had uh, chipmunks and I trap them and uh, take them away. Mice, a lot of mice uh, traps in the garage all the time. So anyway, and you got to keep an eye on those vermins. They bring disease in and stuff like that. And, uh, and the dog, you know, likes to be entertained by the little critters like that. Anyway, uh, also speaking of uh, things outdoors, October is a, a month where there's a, usually a couple of meteor showers that can be quite significant. Of course, nobody really knows until we actually, that those days show up. So I'll try to keep you informed of that. I just had something come across my news feed. That's how we talk to them. I don't say, I haven't watched a news broadcast years now. I watch, unless there's some sort of, obviously, national thing that I need to be aware of, tragedy or uh, political things. But uh, it gets, all comes online. But I'll say one thing about this. Uh, it's certainly... Try to be informed of what's going on as a citizen, as a neighbor, for the benefit of your neighbors. But also, you know, read good stuff. You know, do do the work of who are these people that are writing? What's their editorial policy? They have them even online, and you need to know that because it's gonna that's gonna color the what they either for good or for bad. It's gonna color what uh, people say, and what they choose to publish and pass along. Uh, so no. Uh, know their education if you can. Sometimes that's published. Are, are they up on what they're, what they're opining about? I mean, the the media does perform a vital function or should perform a vital function. Area, so it, it's out there. The good stuff is out there. Uh, you just got to do a little work, and you'll find it. And then you can nice thing is once you find the good sources and have a number of them, you know, just click uh, uh, you know, click on a follow option and. And you'll get regular updates, uh, probably more than you'll want. Also, as far as church news goes, meaning the, the church at large, stay plugged into issues, etc. I put links, there's a, a link right now pinned to the Facebook page about an online book that they published. It's an audio book, uh, just answering objections to the faith. It's excellent. If you haven't listened to that, it's excellent. They're like little 15, 20 minute segments. Anyway, uh, issues, etc. very high level. Uh, they, their tagline is that they have the smartest listeners in radio, and uh, they make you smart. I, I find it incredibly beneficial as a pastor. And they have uh, journalists who cover religious stories, uh, talk about what's going on in the church at large, and uh, some critiques about what you read in the newspapers, because most journalists anymore that you read in, in sort of public newspapers, kind of regular newspapers, the big media outlets, they're very poorly trained in what what denominations teach and they don't know you know and so they get a lot of things wrong so again do your homework be well informed your benefit uh, you'll be a benefit to your neighbors whether they like it or not in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen the lord almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last amen it is good to give thanks to the lord to sing praise to your name almost high to herald your love in the morning your truth at the close of the day tonight Continuing with the daily lectionary, we read from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter, verses 1 through 17. 
And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is, a new, is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skin bursts, and the wine is spilled out, and the skins are destroyed. But the new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. And that is the Gospel of the Lord. So that begins when we hear this in the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, this healing of the paralytic. And we hear how they, we're told elsewhere how there's a, a hole dug in the roof so they can lower him down because there's this, Jesus has already been healing and there's a crowd coming. You know, healing's everything. Uh, even in our world, you know, people will drive miles and miles and miles to go see a doctor. Jesus saw their faith and he says, and this is key, the order of things. He said to the paralytic, courage, take heart. My son, your sins are forgiven. It's the first thing he says. Now that creates a stir. Because, and I've mentioned this before, who can forgive sins? God. That's it. All right? Even when we sin against other, sin against each other, we are sinning against God. And of course, we should go to each other and forgive. But to be, to be forgiven and declared righteous, only God. You know, only God can do that. And these Pharisees recognize that. They, they say, you know, he's blasphemy. He's pretending to be God. That's an incredibly bad sin. Uh, and uh, they're right to think that way. But Jesus, Jesus is, this is a big teaching moment. He knows their thoughts, and he says, why do you think evil in your hearts? You know, all the things that have been happening up to this point, you know, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. Now, I'm bringing in a number of the gospel stories. John is the one that records what John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Yom Kippur. Uh, we talked about that a couple weeks ago uh, as our Jewish friends were celebrating that day of atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, and, and about the importance of Jesus' baptism. We have this temptation, and the healings begin. And we had just had the Sermon on the Mount, this great incredible preaching and um, and what did we have last night because that's just how good my memory is we have the the faith of the centurion a couple nights ago how he heals doesn't even see the, ser the servant of the centurion and and he heals him calms the storm that's what we had last night and so they're seeing all these things and remember again john records this for us where's his first miracle this is going to become significant at the end of this little segment here a wedding the marriage in Canaan. John tells us this was the first of his signs. Remember, John was an apostle, like Matthew. Matthew was both Matthew and John were eyewitnesses, all of it. And John was in the inner circle to Peter, James, and John. So he was sometimes brought into things that Matthew and the others were not, along with the, um, uh, Peter and James. Anyway, Jesus says, "What do you think is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk?" 
but you, that you may know that the Son has the authority to forgive sins. He says, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. He has the authority. And so that's what he's demonstrating here. The true healing, and that's where the difficulty is. How can we be declared forgiven before we go to God? How can I stand before the Holy God, who to be in his presence means you must be holy? I mean, the tabernacle, always try to keep an image of that in our, in our, in our churches, should be built this way. They can't always be built this way. Although I've been in very poor countries like Haiti, and they, even though they, don't, they were building a church last time I was there, and I think it's completed now. But the, so it was a two-story house, and the basement was, or the, the ground floor was pretty much all open. But that's where church was. And they made it look like a church. They had the paper uh, decorations to make it look nice. Uh, the altar was set apart and was away from the people. People sat in pews looking, and there was a, uh, and the pews were not comfortable. They were, there were some chairs, and they were just rough-hewn logs uh, on, on a couple of stands. And people sat there through Bible study in 90-degree heat, dressed in suits, women wearing dresses and hats. Oh, yeah, Haiti. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, um, they made it look holy. So think of the tabernacle, even the way our churches are built. You have the most holy place where God is, and only the high priest can go in there after all these sacrifices and all this blood on the Day of Atonement that one day. He carries us in. That's all bringing us to Jesus Christ. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And then you have the outer room, uh, the holy place, is right next to the most holy place inside that little tent, inside the bigger tabernacle area. And they have the priests. The priests could go in there. They couldn't go into the most holy place to go in there to take care of the, the incense that was there that represents our prayers and the bread of the presence and the, and the lamps, uh, seven uh, seven. They were like a seven-tined um, lampstand that held seven wicks, uh, which is made made to think us made to remind us of creation. Anyway, uh, and then you have the the tabernacle area, and then the people, and then outside of that is the common area. Remember, day of the, the unclean area, the common unclean. Those words used interchangeably in scripture. So they take that scapegoat when all the sins are put on, and they take them out out of the holy, you know, the holy area and God's people out to the unclean area, the common area. And, but your sins are taken away out from the presence of God. So how can we, getting back to this idea of forgiveness, stand in the presence of the holy God? God cannot tolerate sin in his presence. It's not a question of does he want to or, you know, what's his will. The question is, or the point is, his perfect holiness cannot have sin in his presence. Sin dies in the presence of God. Uh, there's a lot of gospel in that, in what he does with us to protect us from that. Ultimately, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we have to be wearing an alias, an alien righteousness because you can't be holy. Now that becomes, the next section that becomes, with this reading tonight, that becomes uh, another important theme that, we, that is introduced here. So Jesus has the authority by his death and resurrection, by who he is, to forgive. When he forgives you because you are covered with his righteousness, you are forgiven. You can have a clean conscience. And that authority he gives to the church. In places like John chapter 20, if you are Lutheran, you had to memorize those passages when you were a kid about how he breathes on the disciples and gives them the Holy Spirit and says, if you forgive. Uh, he says that a couple of times, but he gives that to his church. To, and that when I'm ordained, it's authority is given to me to stand before people and forgive them their sins in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ. It's his authority, never mind. I just, the mouthpiece. So he has the authority. That's the true healing that we all need, forgiveness. These people all got sick and died again. You've heard me mention that many times. The true healing is those words, you're forgiven, and you are in Christ. Stop looking inside your heart. Stop you know, looking at the scales. Do my good works outweigh my bad? The answer is always going to be no if you're being honest with yourself. Because even our good works, which we should do, are tainted with selfishness and sin and stuff like that. Uh, very often do we do spontaneous good works without having at least thoughts of sin creeping, like what's in it for me and aren't I a good boy and won't people pat me on the back and I'm telling you about what goes through my mind. I'm guessing you're just like me. Anyway, now he, after all that, and people are amazed because of this authority and what he does, he sees Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, so the author of this record of our Lord's life. And tax collectors were thieves. They were allowed, to, they were contracted with the Roman government, and they had to give so much money, they were assessed to the government. Their job was to go collect it, and anything they got above the assessment was theirs to keep. 
So of course they were hated by their, their countrymen because they're working for this Gentile government, this foreign government, to fleece their own people. And Jesus says, follow me. And he reclines then uh, at table. He, sit, he sits and eats with them. You can think about what happens in our church every Sunday. And many tax collectors and sinners there. And this creates a problem with the Pharisees. You know, the people like, gosh, you know, what, what is God doing? What, what is this one who claims to be God and claims to have this authority doing with these people? This is exactly what he does with us. And I always remember that. We, we, everybody's welcome in our church. Everybody is. Okay? But you come into church and he, you know, he pronounces that forgiveness on you. He pronounces his word to you and he goes to work on you. He illuminates you because we hear here. Uh, we hear at the end of this segment, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For it came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He doesn't need self-righteous people, people who think they're doing just fine. He needs to tear us down so we realize how much we need a Savior. Then we cling to him. And also what flows from that, not only do we, the more you understand the depth of your sin, the more you understand God's love for you. And it is steadfast. You want to see God's steadfast love? Look to Christ, okay? God's love is, in, you know, the more you learn and, and think about, man, you know, reflect on your life. Reflect on the people that you've hurt, that you've never made amends with. You probably can't. You know, the uh, all the things you've done, you know, slacking off at work, uh, you know, saying hurtful things to people that you love. And think about how much you're forgiven. And then you'll really, then you then you really begin to love God in a in, in a profound way, and it's never complete in this life, and it's always sort of growing that love for God because your awareness of your sin is. So He goes to work on you, and He's trying to tell these people who come in and says, "Well, you know, what's He doing with sinners?" He's like, you "Don't you know you're sick too? If you think you're righteous, then you you aren't going to need me. But you are sick. You know, that's who needs the physician. The, the physician, and He is the great physician, the title that's often." given to him. And also, our good works change when we understand how much we're forgiven. We we are merciful. We understand that, yeah, you know, people do bad things. You know, we harbor bad things in our Maybe we don't act on them, but we harbor them, and we're capable of it. And we, it's, it's, it's very easy to show mercy when you understand how much God has been merciful to you. So, so you see this progression here. You know, okay, you're forgiven. I have the authority to forgive. That's what he's working in his life. And then he starts eating with the people who need the forgiveness, you know, the tax collectors, the sinners, all of us. He creates a stir and he says, you need to understand why I'm here. I'm here. I'm here for sinners and tax collectors, which is all of us. He's going to die for all of us. Not everybody realizes that. And then John's disciples are sent and he says, why don't your, and the question is, why don't your disciples fast? And this is a nod to things that, you know, the whole Old Testament is moving to this moment. There's all this imagery in the Old Testament, particularly the Song of Solomon, and I've mentioned this a number of times, the Song of Solomon, which we hardly ever read, and read just a tiny portion of it. It's not a big book anyway. It was read in its entirety to these Old Testament people, our forebears in the faith, alongside Ecclesiastes and a number of other books. Uh, it was one of the great scrolls. So every year it was read in its entirety. I want to say it was read at the Passover, too. Uh, my memory is failing me a little bit on that. But they were, and then there's, you know, psalm after psalm is this wedding imagery uh, about, and it comes up in a number of the prophets, too, about Hosea in particular, but God being the groom, our Lord being the groom, and we're the bride, and dressed in, he dresses us with his holy and righteousness. And where's his first miracle? At, a, at his first sign, at a wedding. The party has started, and that's what he's saying here. Hey, it, the wedding feast has begun. You know, it's here, and, and you know, the fasting's going to come back in, you know, when he ascends and stuff like that. We are left here in this time of tribulation, waiting for the consummation, waiting for our bridegroom to return, uh, and that day will come. You know, but he is, he's reminding us, like, hey, the party has started. The wedding party has started. They, are, should, be, they should all be aware of it, as should we. You know, but uh, often, you, you know, either you're so close to it or you just don't want to see it, so you don't. Let's open our eyes. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Again, may we resolve to know nothing but the preaching of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ among us, and there see God's love for us, and see uh, the depth of our salvation. And may we pray for the spread of this great news throughout the world, throughout our communities, throughout our families. We pray for all who um, proclaim this word, my brothers in office, missionaries throughout the word, and those who are persecuted and oppressed for the proclamation of that word. Keep them steadfast in their confession, uphold them, and turn the hearts of those who inflict such evil upon our brothers and sisters. As always, we pray for the sick and dying. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Wayne, Ardo, Klaus, Lou Ray, my brother in office, Cecil, friends of our congregation, Josiah, Katie, Phil, Joe, Liberty, Don, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Bert, Ron, Tim, Sue, Karen, Dave, Anita, Marlis, Jeremy, Dylan, Jeff, Christy, Brad, Paul, Tom, Eric, Chris, Beth, Clint, Jim, Bob, Jason, Camden, Ashley, Fern, Joan, Don, Amy, Scott, Allie, Allison, Aaron, Lorena, and all who cry out to you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, according to your good and gracious will, place your healing hand upon them. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you on the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing stanza 1 of 516, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying. Wake, awake, for night is flying. The watchmen on the heights are crying. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight hears the welcome voices, and at the thrilling cry rejoices. Oh, where are ye, ye virgins wise? The bridegroom comes away. Your lamps with gladness take, Alleluia. With bridal care, yourselves prepare to meet the bridegroom who is near. And that stands one of three of 516. Wake, awake, for night is flying. Walk it off, the German title for that in. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a pleasant rest. And by God's grace, we will see you tomorrow night. Good night.